Boom. You're welcome. All right. How's it going? Oh, come on. We need some more people. I want at least 49 so I get the full grid. Uh, I want to share my screen of just showing my Zoom view. But I don't think that works. Oh, maybe you can. Or does it make an infinite loop? All right. I'll share my normal screen. Ready? More people pop in or not. Welcome. What is it? Friday. We're talking about startups. And by we, I mean, it seems like it's just me. There we go. Oh, here I am again. This is Harveyside College somewhere. All right. I'm going to get right into it. Money stuff. And this is the last uh, sort of lecture one week. Next week, we'll have a practice demo day. Um, and actually, I think we're going to use this system called, I can't remember the name right now, but I just visited, uh, I like to copy other successful things. So uh, Techstars had their demo day yesterday. And uh, it's, I think it's called a Remo or something, but it's very like a virtual conference room. There's like a map with tables and you have a table that's like for each company and you like click on a table and then you're in a, in a break, basically a breakout room since no one could ever figure out how to get into their own breakout rooms on Zoom. I think we're gonna try that. So we're gonna do that next Friday. Um, but you still just go to this URL. It's still gonna be hmc.com slash Zoom. It's just going to redirect you somewhere else. All right. Um, already recording. OK. This is the schedule. Once again, this week, we're going to have a special breakouts in the categories of um, accounting, financial, uh, financing, or fundraising, and exiting. So I won't pause, but next week, I get all those mentors in there so they can go around and people can talk about their practice and practice them or give them mentor. Uh, yeah, these will be the three. We have a, a guest speaker from Early Growth, which is one of the little companies that you actually get some free goodies for. They're like an accounting for startups and fractional CFO thing. Um, but I just updated that document if you got the goodies document with their information. And he'll be on in the next minutes or so. Be ready for that breakout. And then I'm going to do the one on fundraising, even though I pretty much bootstrapped everything. But, and Randy's going to do the one on exiting. Thanks, Randy, because he's done it a couple times, at least a couple times. So once again, don't name yourself with a pod. Change your name to the track, either accounting, fundraising, exiting. If you can't figure out how to get into your own breakout room, uh, that'll help me put you in the right one. Uh, reminders as usual, Tuesday lunch club, Wednesday afternoon, mentor office hours, demo day is only two weeks away. So if you haven't launched, launch. Uh, if you haven't sent me your one minute video and or your, and your one slide deck, get it to me like today. I don't know, getting it down to the wire. The other thing that you probably want to do, you don't really have to have it, but you're gonna, if you're actually getting serious and trying to talk to investors, you're going to need a regular deck. So not just the one page deck, probably at least, at least it's probably eight pages. Uh, I wouldn't go more than like 14 to 20. And then if you really have tons of stuff, you can put an appendix at the end. I have some example. Yeah, so you can email me that deck also. And I'll also get back to you about your one minute videos and your uh, one, one slide update. If you haven't already gotten that. I put at this URL just now some deck as examples. I'm not saying they're all great decks, but it's just a collection of some decks to give you a, a feeling in there. So you can still go there and see one minute pitches, one slide. And Boom. And moving right along. Yeah, 
send me that stuff, you get those uh, cool goodies. Okay, let's get in to accounting. So accounting, this is kind of, uh, okay. Uh, a little bit like my legal talk where I'm not big on accounting either. <laughs> no, I'm not, not that it's not important, but it's not something that I uh, am a super specialist on. A lot of times people just want to know like the nitty gritty of just like, how do I keep track? What should I use? You can obviously use, you know, something like QuickBooks. You can use some of these, Zero Bench Engineering. You can use Early Growth um, to help you. They're a little more expensive. Uh, and you can also just, do something like a spreadsheet for a while to keep track. Um, in the early days of accounting, like pre-revenue, pre-customers, it's sort of just keeping track of your expenses a little bit and figuring out your burn rate and looking at your payroll, if you have a payroll or your own personal burn rate and just getting a sense of how much, like how urgent is it to launch, which is always urgent <laughs> and how far, um, can you go without bringing in any extra dollars? And if that number is less than six months, you probably need to start thinking seriously about how you're going to extend that, whether it's cutting expenses or bringing in revenue or bringing in investment. So we'll have a breakout, I guess. Um, yeah, this is, you know, I think this is supposed to be in the fundraising part. Oh, well, my slides are late night slide making here. So this is sort of a list of just the, the world of um, ways you can get money, right? Like uh, raise money. Everyone sort of just thinks of like VCs, but there's a lot of different things. Um, you can see them right there. They all sort of have different kind of terms and different targets and different requirements and different amounts, different difficulty. And Vi, spoiler alert. Oh yeah, that was supposed to be one slide off there. <laughs> the best way is cash flow, customers. So I was already done with accounting, getting into fundraising. And cash flow, customers is the best way because it's serving a dual purpose of extending your runway and validating your business model and telling you what to focus on. So that's sort of historically what I've been um, most about is uh, just getting it out cheaply early and starting to charge for it and starting to see if you can charge more than it costs you to make. And as soon as you get to that, there's this Y common you're saying of sort of default alive and default dead. Um, it doesn't exactly mean that you're just cash flow positive, uh, but it essentially means that if things continue as they are, you will never run out of money. And so you kind of want to get to that state where if things continue as they are, whether that's like I'm adding 10 customers a month or I'm adding, you know, or the customers I have are just rebuilding and no one's ever leaving and my expenses are dropping, then you can, you know, figure it out and see if you'll ever go into negative cash. Um, default alive does not mean that I can continuously raise larger and larger rounds because of my charisma forever like uh, we work or something like that. Um, that is a, a model that is sometimes uh, effective for certain founders. So going through the ways you can get money, there's also your parents, <laughs> people like that. Um, that was just reminding us of the last few weeks of uh, this. I made this slide deck originally early 2017. So hopefully I'll be able to retire this slide soon. All right, now I'm gonna get into, uh, it's actually Paul Graham's sort of advice on fundraising from actual uh, investors, you know, and not some of those other methods, whether it's government grants or customers or uh, bank loans or things like that. So in general, it's, I mean, it's happened, but it's pretty hard to just get an investor to get excited and uh, um, write you a check or even take a phone call or even reply to your email with a cold email. <laughs> if you can't get to them, which hopefully we can help. Um, and it's, there's just so much inbound for in known public investors that 
they're not going to even bother uh, generally. And it's hard, even if you have this great idea, I don't know, you're just not going to get their attention without getting intro. So that's a sort of a good purpose of accelerators and things like this to sort of help people who aren't in the networks already get that first uh, foot in the door into the networks. Um, another guide is don't raise just, you know, willy nilly, actually make it a concerted effort um, a, or not a concerted effort, obviously, but a, a real decision that you've uh, thought about and you know it's a good time. And typically a good time is you either just did something fantastic or you have a really good pitch that you're about to do something fantastic. And so, you know, that's like, I just had the idea, maybe that's sort of an okay time because you're like, I'm about to do this thing and that we're getting together and this is the first money and we don't have a lot of uh, data to look at yet, but it's gonna be a low valuation. So high risk, high return, or you just had this great want or something, or you got this big customer and revenue looks really good right now. And basically an investor can look at your last whatever months and draw a line and go, wow, this is going well. And, and that's usually an easier time to fundraise um, or you're about to launch something. You finally got this big partnership. It's like in next week. Anyway, there, there should be a, a sort of a good reason that this is the right time to fundraise and not just like, I was almost out of money. So I decided I needed to go get more money or I would have to go out of business. It's a, it's a hard pitch. Uh, okay, yeah, and so talking about the concerted effort, it's actually super distracting and a big drain on the real kind of important things in your business of like marketing and developing your product and all that. Um, so you wanna try and compress it down <laughs> as much as you can, you know, easier said than done. And it depends on the environment. It depends on your particular situation, but like turn it on. Hopefully you're fundraising. I mean, ideally it's like a month and you, you go out all at once to everybody that you've uh, built relationships with in the past and told them that you're not fundraising now. And you can go back to them and say, yes, I am fundraising today. Finally, this is your moment. So here's the deal and get them all at once. Cause you want to get that same thing. I'm mean, talking about leverage, right? Where you don't want to be the one um, you know, have the one investor who's, who's sort of you're talking to and he, that investor is looking at 50 companies at the same time, which they always are. Um, and they can just pick and choose and you have to be the best company and they don't feel very urgent about anything. You got to make it so you're the one company that's raising right now for this one or two week period. And you've got 50 investors who are all looking at it. And then there's just a lot of kind of like, oh, I'm talking to this one tomorrow. I'm talking to this one. And there's a lot of fear of missing out and uh, it just helps. And, it, and then it also... It works better, it's faster, so you're not distracted as long. And um, I'll let someone else reply up here while I talk. Let's see. And the next thing is how to prioritize. If you do have a big list um, and you're talking to a lot of investors at once, it's pretty much by expected value. So you could have like, oh, it would be awesome if I got Sequoia to uh, invest in me and I have like a sort of a semi-warm intro to like a very, my, you know, junior person at Sequoia. So I'm gonna get really pumped about that. And then I have this like, you know, friend of my uncle who's this angel investor who will probably put in, you know, he doesn't have a brand. He's not gonna bring on other stuff, but he's like 90% likely to close for $25,000 or something like that. So you kind of got to multiply the chances times how valuable it is to figure out the expected value and just prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Cause you want to get this done fast and you want to be efficient. You should have a plan B. Um, don't put all your eggs in one plan. <laughs> and that plan is like, we're going to raise $1 million or we're bust. Uh, usually it's a plan B in terms of not raising as much as you want. Um, but you kind of want to phrase it the other way. You want to start actually with less money and say, we're only raising, you know, 200 K, uh, but we have a plan B if we get a lot of interest that we could raise more. Um, it's just easier to get people interested when you're already almost done raising and you're oversubscribed and it's also more realistic. <laughs> Don't just come out with like, we're raising a $300 million, you know, round right now. 
And so I'm just need intros to these uh, big, big, big funds. Anybody, anybody, you know, keep it's sort of like right sizing your product market team industry fit with your founder, making sure everything fits, like raising the amount of money you raise should sort of fit with the state of your company, right? Like what do you really need realistically? Like pretend it's your own money. Pretend you have a pile of money over here that you were saving for your retirement. Well, how much would you move into your startup at this point? And would you be able to effectively use it? And would it be nice if you could have, you know, if you weren't constrained with that amount, what would you even do if you got $5 million? Like, could you even effectively do anything? And maybe you do have a thing and that's your plan B. And you can always bring that up and get the investors more excited. If they're like, well, it's too small for us. You know, what would you do with a million dollars? Something like that. And you're like, I would grow 10 times as fast. Uh, you don't really talk about the valuation upfront. It's not like we're worth $5 million or we're worth $1 million or we're worth 10 million. It's more about the amount of money because uh, in general, that should be what you're thinking about. Like, I need this much money because so I can achieve these things. Um, and then, I mean, it typically works out that maybe the valuation is, you know, five times the amount of money and something in that ballpark, but it'll be sort of, you know, fluid based on how much interest you get. And there could be other elements to the terms. Um, but you don't really need to talk about that the right away out of the, I mean, some investors will just ask that like, Oh, how much are you raising? Oh, what are you, what are the terms? And you can be, I don't know. You say, well, we're not that concerned about terms. We want to find the right partner. We want to raise this amount to get things right. And we're still, you know, figuring it out, but we're going to have, you know, reasonable terms. And only once it's getting a little further, you know, third, second, third conversation with them, um, you can start to feel out where they are. Uh, just totally like tactical stuff. Every time you talk with them, make sure there's something that you know you can follow up on like are you going to go talk to someone and you get back to me on Tuesday after your partner meeting uh, are we good should I send you over our safe document um, you should literally sort of ask them like are you interested in investing or if it's in fundraising if it's are you interested in partnering whatever uh, actually kind of ask <laughs> let's see if they like get back to you about that and they're like yeah yeah we're interested we just gotta do something you know it's just good to know where you stand so you're not wasting time you can update your expected value uh when they do make an offer you gotta pretty much grab it <laughs> you know don't now then don't you go back and think about it for a week or something like you same day is good to do and if you've got a deal you know sort of stop talking take the offer uh let's see actually close and get the money follow up there can be weird things happen where coronavirus hits and you didn't get the wire and they go yeah we know we kind of signed the thing but like look at the world we really can't close and you're off by like oh i should have gotten the wire yesterday i would have had the money um once you get one investor you're actually halfway done because it's it's such i mean if you have a, a real lead investor you're you're like totally <laughs> done but any kind of uh, investor is just a, such a good, like you get a cheerleader, you get the intros, you get um, a little bit of money. You know, there's just this social proof and investors are mostly sheep, don't really want to be the one that is leading. They kind of want to just put their money around and things that seem good and, and trust that someone else is actually like someone they trust is, is watching it. So once you have that first investor, you know, the, the better the investor, the better, but any investor is a, a good one. It's, it's really like, if you have no investors or it's just your parents or your self funding, you're like, it's like, uh, do I want to be the first person to really take this leap of faith? It's a lot easier once you have one. And once again, cash flows everything around me. You don't have to worry about any of this if you get cash flow positive. All right, another just, Thing to remember is to be nice in all these conversations people are going to be weird they're going to act like they're totally into you and about to invest and then they're like i'll just i'll email you tomorrow morning or i'll call you back or something and it's just like nothing uh and you try following up and whatever and it's just nothing crickets yeah don't take it personally that's just sort of how it goes and you, you know life is long and they'll be back or you'll be back later. And so don't burn any bridges. And um, 
things will work out better that way. Don't, don't take it personally. It's, it's rough. And if it's not working, no one's getting back to you. Don't just drag it out forever. And it's like, I'm fundraising, fundraising. Remember, it's, it's a limited time thing. It's going to kill your company. Um, it's just maybe it wasn't the right time. You thought it was, it wasn't. Uh, you learned something, you're pivoting. It's like you're pivoting your product. You can pivot your fundraising. So go back, just stop. Don't waste any more time on it. And, uh, you know, come back in three months, six months, or figure out what this means if you're on to plan B now. All right, exiting, speaking of plan B. So this is the goal, kind of. It's exciting. Exiting is almost like the word exciting, but it's scary. Uh, this is assuming you've got a company that is in some kind of position to exit. I mean, you've probably been working on it at least two years, if not seven or 17 years. Uh, and it's probably, you're pretty comfortable, at least, um, I don't know, if you're making lots of money, you're comfortable in that sense. But no matter what, you're, you're, you've, you've probably gotten used to whatever the state of this, this uh, startup is. So you're kind of, I know I definitely had this feeling of dream house, which is like, especially if it's going kind of well, you're like, am I a one trick pony? <laughs> is this it? Like if I exit this, is this like, was this my one thing, a one hit wonder? Um, it's possible, but I think Michael Bunn, one of our managers says, Hey, even if it was, at least you got one. That's pretty good. Most people would be happy to have one, one hit. Don't, don't knock a one hit wonder. Um, so yeah, you might be a one hit wonder, but there's still reasons to exit and, and do other things in your life. I'm not saying necessarily. Um, and I'm also just saying like, if this is an option, I'm not saying everyone has that option. Um, so, you know, just appreciate if you get that option that you have that option, like whatever you are in the top 10% of startups that actually got to exit in a, a positive way. So, yeah. So you might be a one trick pony, but in the words of Charles Barkley, I doubt it. Come on, you guys could do another one. Um, just need confidence. So when, when would you exit? Uh, I mean, going back to kind of that first um, presentation I did about sort of growing wealth and the timing of things. Uh, this is Michael Blend again, a good quote. It's always in <laughs> his opinion, he's, he's the king of selling things maybe a little too early, but like it worked out great. Um, I think sort of the rule of thumb, right? Like it, if you have, you know, if you triple your sort of net worth, then that's what matters. And if you can sell, um, if you can sell, my other rule was like that, if you remember this graph, 30% doesn't really matter. So if you sell like 30% of your, of, of any asset, let's say it's your company or whatever, you have a bunch of Bitcoin and it's gone crazy and you look at it and you go, okay, not counting my company, what's my net worth? Let's say it's hundred K. Now let's say my, my shares in the company is like 10 million, okay? You're like, if I sold 30% of my company, I would get $3 million. So that would be a 30 times uh, increase in my sort of not counting the company net worth of 100K over here. That's, that's like, yeah, you should think about it. <laughs> it's a good time. Um, because you're gonna you're gonna basically jump up three le like levels of your life of a three x a three x a three x you're gonna jump three times, and you're only gonna take thirty percent off the table, which doesn't really matter anyway. That's that's sort of the no brainer zone where you're like, I could sell thirty percent of this asset, and it would do it would make me thirty x over here, um, and then so a lot of it really is just what valuation can you get? What is the rest of your uh, life look like? How you know, even if you're like, no, but my company's going to go like amazing. Like, I don't think there's anything better to do right now. Of course, people want to buy my company because it's, it's blowing up. It's like, yeah, you could let it all ride. Um, but you may be wrong. <laughs> you may be wrong. You may, there may be coronavirus around the corner. There could be something you're missing. And it really doesn't matter if you sell up to 30%. I'm saying, you know, maybe you sell 10%, maybe you sell 5% or something like that. But it, it's kind of like when you're in that ballpark where you can kind of triple the rest of your money by selling a tiny fraction of your, your company or any asset, I'd say that's a good time to think about doing it um, because then there's going to be a downturn. There's going to be something. You're going to find other opportunities. This is not the end of your life. Life is long. 
in that regard, but the way to get rich, right, is to is leverage and compounding. Um, so if you're selling your company, you're kind of ending your compounding. The key is to really getting growing wealth is to let it ride, <laughs> to keep compounding. That's how you get rich. Um, and so the leverage part of this is tying back into that same thing I was talking about in that first uh, class lecture thing about you just want more people bidding on you than there are people like you. So if you're in a hot space, you've got three or four great partnerships with strategics, they're all sniffing around, you can get three bidders going, like you might end up where like, you're like, I think our company's worth 20 million. And we're going to raise, you know, a series B now, like two, you know, another 10 million and go big or whatever. And then all of a sudden, like when your street's like, why don't, gee, why don't we just acquire you now? You know, and then you're like, oh, we don't want to do that. But then all of a sudden you've got another guy who gets in there. And as soon as you have two, you're set. And if you have three, you're super set. But like that 20 million could end up being like a 200 million or something like that. And then you got to really think like, am I going to, what are the chances that I can actually 10x the value of my company? They become these frenzies. So it, it's when you really have to sit back and say, okay, yeah, if I could sell the whole thing for 200 million, like that would be, of course, idiotic not to take, but it's still, it'll still like, once anything happens, people get greedy and they go, yeah, they, they just kind of internalize that and say, cool. Yes. The company's worth 200 million done, but they don't really sell it. It's like, you didn't really get the wire. <laughs> and then like one of those bidders drops out and something changes and, you know, Trump administration announces something. And all of a sudden your whole industry is upended and you're like, why didn't I just take a little diversification there? Um, so again, the compounding part is the thing you're giving up a little bit of. Uh, it's hard to get rich or die trying if you're not getting any compounding going on, but maybe your goal shouldn't once you're at that point to get rich or die trying. It's now to stay rich and enjoy living. That's the difference. If you want to get rich, you get concentrated. Once you are rich on paper, it's time to get some diversity in your portfolio and diversify. But once again, it's really up to you. And I don't know, like Charles Barkley says, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. All right, that's it. Woo! Stop my presentations, do some breakout rooms. How do I stop my screen share? There we go. Boom. Uh, stop recording.